Good evening, dear viewers of scientific meetings. Today's topic regards the resilience of United uh, Ukrainian nation. And thankful to my colleague historian from USA who agreed to be our speaker today's evening. He wants to support people of Ukraine during this difficult time, dangerous time. I am introducing our speaker and lecturer today, Benjamin Peters from Tulsa, USA, University of Tulsa, USA. He's associate professor and also the uh, the audio while event is uh, 20 30 minutes because Ben uh, have his day break it also I must mention that it's not a lecture it's rather a talk because Ben wants to communicate with us so be free to ask questions to interrupt him to make remarks and uh, I think we shall start Ben you can great. start Great, thank you so much, um, Sergei Javan. I really appreciate the invitation and good evening to everyone um, on this call. Uh, I am um, honored to be able to uh, share a few thoughts with you, particularly at this time of just horrific suffering and uh, at a time in which many of you, my dear friends, are facing uh, the consequences of an unprovoked and murderous war. Um, wrought upon your land. Uh, particularly, my heart goes out to, to everyone in Ukraine, um, especially those in Kiev, as, as uh, you're under a two-day shutdown and, and the, the, the situation is heating up. Um, I have, as uh, uh, Sergei suggested, some very brief comments for us today. I'm also including in the chat a few links that you're welcome to learn more about my work through. Uh, the first one is to a, a new book topic. The next one is to a collection of my past scholarship, uh, also some small writings of, of late. The last link, uh, which I will share separately here, is uh, again, is a list of resources that I have seen um, and I am sharing here in case those in Ukraine or outside can, can help. Um, so feel free to add to this and improve it. Um, I've also added some of the texts that I think Safe the Lord will add in a second. Um, so let me just, again, begin by briefly introducing myself. My name is Ben Peters. I, I am the author of the book, How Not to Network a Nation, The Uneasy History of the Soviet Internet. I'm, I'm honored to have lived in Ukraine about one year of my life, um, in, but cumulatively uh, over visits in 2004, 2007, 2012, 2015, in 2019. Um, I'm not speaking Russian today uh, as, a, as a choice, but uh, for convenience of conversation, I do speak uh, Russian and I read Ukrainian and would be happy to receive conversation in any language, um, a German, uh, whatever would help. Um, so uh, briefly, I thought maybe I could set up um, a longer, different perspective um, of how my thinking about Ukraine has evolved and how I'm uh, both humbled and excited by the, re the resilience, what I'm calling the networked resilience of Ukraine um, through the story of Ogos. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the book, um, about how I wrote it and then my argument and then how I'm seeing that argument shift um, in light of a larger Ukrainian story. So um, when I was a PhD student at Columbia University, I was looking for a dissertation topic and it occurred to me that there was uh, you know, an untold story. Of why did the Cold War, which developed so many different technologies, develop the internet in, one, in, the, in the industrialized uh, West and but also somehow not in the Soviet Union? Where was the Soviet internet as it were? This, this, uh, this question brought me into archival research in initially Moscow um, uh, in 2006, um, where I encountered uh, obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, and I could not make progress. And it wasn't until a colleague at MIT connected me to Vera Glushkova and others um, in, um, in the circles of, the, um, of cybernetics in Kiev that uh, the story became tellable. Um, and so in short, I thought I was going to write a history of computer networks. And I guess I did, 
But I also ended up writing, I realize now, a history of Ukrainian networked resilience. Let me tell you a little bit more about what I mean. So the first thing to do is just to kind of recast, an, a, a, I think the stories that I'm hearing emerging right now um, in ways that could be tell us a deeper and more interesting story. Um, namely, when we think about how Ukraine as a country has formed as a people, right? we have to understand not a computer network, but a network of, of empires long past. So of course, there's the Norse, there's the Holy Roman Empire, the Mongol Horde, the Ottomans, the Austro-Hungarians, uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Russian uh, Empire, the Soviet Empire, uh, Soviet Union, uh, of course, the Nazis, uh, and then again, the Soviet uh, Union, and now the Russian Federation, all of which have occupied, formed, and shaped uh, the people that over the last 30 years have enjoyed the sovereign territory of Ukraine. And I think that this kind of fact that Ukraine, what I'm trying to say is that it is that the geographic as well as historical crossroads of Europe, of Russia, and of the Middle East, um, that uh, that you know, Odessa, uh, the Odyssey, the Odysseus, right? That there's there's deep roots here that help shape um, a more resilient cultural and institutional approach to these questions than a conventional vision of computer networks might. Um, and I want to just you know make a shout out for the fact that uh, um, uh, the you know I think in addition to defending your homeland right now, Ukraine is also defending uh, Europe and Central Asia um, in many ways from uh, a resurgent imperial Russia under Putin. Um, and that, that resilience, I think, um, expresses itself far more than in the networked uh, story. Uh, of course, it's also necessary to note that, you know, Kyiv has strong claims to being the cradle of Eastern Slavic uh, cultures in many ways. Um, and so they're defending also not just a geography, but a history uh, worth defending and a history that's been corrupted um, in, in the current uh, uh, war. So I think uh, there's also another thing to say, which is that in the present day moment, we're seeing that uh, Ukraine um, holds some of the deeper wells in, in the world economy in cyber talents, uh, right? So not only is this a geographic, geostrategic situation? Not only is there historical resilience, but there's also an emergent multi-generational talent within cyber, uh, um, uh, cyber work, cyber defense um, uh, that I think deserves some kind of attention. Um, so for example, as you may have all seen recently, um, you know, I think the world is slowly becoming aware that many of the apps on our smartphones were partially programmed by Ukrainians and others. It's also worth noting that the cyber talent that emerges in Ukraine and also even in Russia, interestingly, um, are not, uh, not state aligned in a way uh, that is very important right now in the sense that, for example, Kondi, C-O-N-D-I is a Russian business, a Russian speaking, usually considered cyber criminal business network, but let's just call it a cyber business network um, that recently uh, declared itself pro-Putin. Um, and when it did that, uh, uh, and it's one of many, when it did that, it's Ukrainian members uh, the next day disclosed or published internal threats of, of the network. And so I think what this suggests to me is that the, the massive and substantial cyber talents that are available in this part of the world are not mobilizing around uh, uh, around the the Russian um, military interests because they understand uh, um, something about the resilience of Ukraine. So again, what I'm just briefly setting up is a pretext for thinking about geography, history, and then the current cyber situation as bookends for uh, recontextualizing the orgas, right? Now. Uh, and I'll, I'll be quiet here in a moment, but as some of you may have known from uh, Slava Gorovich's uh, fantastic article, uh, and I should note that, uh, thank you Yaroslav for um, mentioning that, that I had reached out to exactly Slava at MIT um, and uh, in 2007, and I had said, you know, I'm stuck here in Moscow, help me out, I can't get access to the archives. And he said, oh, you should look at this draft um, 
uh, that I'm writing. So he sent me uh, the draft of this uh, of this article, um, and then we talked about it, and and then I I, I moved to to, to Ukraine. Um, so briefly, uh, I want to suggest that the richness of the Orgas uh, project is in part that it carries the character of some of this historical, geographic, um, and, um, and even contemporary cyber richness in its expression. Um, so the history of the Orgas, or the Obstrugas Nationalia Automatizirovena Sistema Upravlenia is um, of course a, a project that uh, carries the character of the time in which it was um, um, proposed. And it is in many ways a subset a case study in this larger resilience. Um, in other words, it is a, a project that imagines itself as simultaneously local as well as universal in, um, in its conception of how networks can serve interests. Uh, and, and I think this is most clearly expressed in its bold attempt seen in no other network projects that I know of besides perhaps CyberSyn, but in a very different way, Proyecto CyberSyn um, in, in Chile, um, it ascribed its network powers to a political economy. Um, and as such, it imagined a local and a universal in uh, a, 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 not just a simple imitation of the command planned economy structure of the Soviet Union, but in a, 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 a importantly decentralized a structure, um, right? So that there would be opportunity for local decision making, as well as input and feedback um, up and up to the regional and to the uh, federal um, levels of planning. And I think this expresses uh, again a kind of networked understanding of of uh, of local uh, different. Um, we'll also note that while the Olgas project did not succeed for reasons that I read in my book about largely about bureaucracy from Moscow, um, that there are very interesting expressions, local expressions of um, automated uh, uh, government systems, ASUs, right? Automatizirovanai systemi upravlenia in in Lviv, in uh, developing in moments in Bulgaria um, that express like a a. a a, a, not a periphery, but a, a local um, resilience of, of networks. And I think, um, again, the, the richness of the, particularly of the Glushkovian is that in his mathematicalization, in his formalization um, of it, this network, um, he imagines networks in a way that I think still today, because it's formal, Um, in, in the modern world, which is to say that when he tried to develop the network, he did it in a way that would be not only uh, sort of formally expressible as a, for any planned economy, but that he would also work on the, the local politics of it, aligning it with military commanders, uh, trying to, to bridge the military and civilian funding gap, the silos of funding that kept um, economists separate from, from generals. Um, they, he and his networks also worked to really, I think in many ways, unify scientific um, innovations across uh, what could possibly be, um, at least in its foundations, a military network that would have civilian purposes. So this, this required not just an alliance of military and, and civilian politics, it required an alliance of scientists. Um, uh, and so I think, what I'm suggesting is, and I'll be quiet here now in a moment, is that my initial reading, um, which largely blames, I think, still accurately, the kind of bureaucratic infighting um, within Moscow uh, as the root cause of why the Orgas did, did not take shape, although there are many others that I spend a book talking about. Um, what I miss in my book um, and what I would like to get better going forward is a a stronger understanding of, of the expression, the like historical and geopolitical and institutional uh, um, uh, resilience of networks that are not computers in Ukraine. And that that kind of networked history without the computer in many ways gives a resilience to the fact that this first computer project failed, right? It's not the computer project that's necessary. It's the larger history of networked Ukraine that I think gives us not only 
an understanding for Ogas and how it applies, but more importantly right now, an understanding of how Ukraine remains um, anything but on the border, but it's rather central to um, so many different approaches to networked history. So let me, let me be quiet here, uh, except in, in short to simply summarize my point, which is that uh, recent events, as well as a rereading of, uh, uh, of historical events, I think are teaching me slowly to pay more attention to the fact that networks are indeed what's at stake in the Orgas, even if uh, the computer network never came to be. For in the study of the Orgas network, we see resilient historical networks of multi-ethnic people coming together. We see uh, political networks um, aligning between uh, regions and states and cities. Um, um, we see uh, international uh, cooperative networks of scientists who are trying to bridge internally the military civilian divide, but also externally, uh, you know, uh, inter international cooperation with other computer scientists. Um, and that's in the process demonstrating the res networked resilience of Ukraine, even in the very act of the, the failure of its first and most ambitious computer network project. So um, I will stop here for a moment, hoping that we can um, turn this into a much broader series of questions. Um, and noting, I'm going to again share uh, this uh, brief document, hoping that you all can improve upon it. It should be editable if you wish, but this is a, an expression of many of the networks of resources available to us now. Um, and I would be happy to you know, chat with you all and see what I can do to help. Uh, yeah, well, yes, ben, question. Uh, what if we try uh, to think of uh, what you've told from another point of view. Uh, if we, uh, there, there were reasons because why did possible Soviet internet projects failed, mm -hmm. but what could it achieve in the most favorable scenario? You know, mm -hmm. if there were no financial or bureaucratic uh, problem, problems, what could it achieve? How could it uh, advance science? Could it uh, delay or could it uh, approach fall of USSR or other possible co consequences for culture, for science, for politics, uh, etc. Thank you. Sure, thank you. So I, I love this question. Let me take two steps. The, so my reading of the history of network uh, resilience of Ukraine suggests two possible responses. One is that um, that it's not necessary for OGAS to succeed formally in order for it to have consequences in the networked history. So I think that's one dodge. Um, and the second is, and this is just a caution as a historian, is that I think, you know, the, the conditions that we would have to require to imagine it to succeed formally, namely financial and bureaucratic obstacles being overcome, put us in a world that's not adjacent to our own, right? It's probably not the case that it was ever very close. But to your point, if we imagine ourselves to an, an OGAS project that was successful, then I think one can imagine counterfactually, and forgive me for this, but one can imagine um, a Soviet Union that would not have um, had its internal economic uh, collapse uh, um, as, as, as easily, right? If there were a kind of electrification or digitalization of the planned economy, then surely um, one can also see uh, the Soviet Union prolonging its existence. Um, one can also imagine a kind of uh, potential synergy between different types of economies. Um, uh, you know, I, I see a lot of value in how the OGAS is thinking about planned equilibria and predicting equilibria, um, how it's thinking about um, electronic currencies, and in, in many ways, I would hope that uh, if it were to succeed, or if indeed its theory were to succeed, um, that we in the 21st century would see, see the kind of failed uh, conflict between socialism and capitalism, right? That we would have an opportunity to realize that there's the same mechanisms in both and that there's a genuine opportunity for the work of the Orgas to not just prolong the Soviet Union, but also contribute meaningfully to uh, a networked world economy. Um, so I think there's also, um, 
you know, really, really interesting theoretical um, ambitions uh, that you're seeing coming out of the Glushkovian school uh, around, you know, uh, semantic uh, based programming, right? That would have been a, a significant um, improvement on human computer relations, uh, the, you know, and, and a number of other ones, right? Concrete hardware projects that uh, proceeded, but I think, you know, electronic currency, which, you know, is defended beautifully in terms of you know, dialectical materialism and Marxism in his day, but also could today, uh, you know, be fully, fully workable um, in financial technology and other places. Um, I think there's also a really interesting um, idea that borders on science fiction, but it's nevertheless, you know, we are in the space of science fiction now, <laughs> uh, uh, which would be like the idea of mind uploading, we call it in English, or the informazione besmirtia, like this idea of uh, being able to like preserve your memories after your death in a dynamic memory network. Um, so these, these are bold, bold, bold thoughts whose application did not come to be, but I think they have uh, really beautiful consequences for how we could think or maybe even better rethink our contemporary world. Um, Again, collapse socialism, copy, uh, capitalism, you know, uh, give us a, a bolder way to think about human computer relations um, and, uh, and, and, and uh, just broadly recognize the networked generalities throughout much of our lives. So, pardon me. Yeah. Uh, uh, ben, I don't want to sound the pessimism. Uh, please, at, please. At, uh, yes. Uh, uh, after, after all, we are a border in uh, science fiction, as you say, it's uh, purely a hypothetical field. Uh, but wouldn't if August system be realized, uh, become it a kind of re re not relic, a rudiment system like uh, left way uh, roads in Britain, like different uh, the di different uh, railway with uh, in the uh, former Soviet Union. So wouldn't it uh, delay now uh, be a reason uh, for delay now? Uh, causing, uh, causing problems, uh, converting from one format to different, because now we use the same systems, we use the same intercompatible processors, the same HTML, uh, this uh, TCP IP <laughs> protocols, uh, because it uh, the internet technologies came here to the open, to, to um, empty field. Mm -hmm. uh, we became more globalized and more. Yeah, uh, I see. Yeah. Better connected with the whole world. We, we jumped over the stage of independent development. Uh, yeah, I, I, all, I, see, just I see that. Article. No, sure. So, I, I mean, I understand where you're coming from. I think that's, that's helpful. Um, and it is true that, you know, most internet network technologies today assume one common system of interoperability, right? There's common protocols that underlie much of this. Um, but I think to your point, actually, um, how about this? In some ways, the uh, hypothetical scientific fictional success of uh, the OGAS would actually demonstrate more openly something that I think is also true, which is that there has never been one network but there are many, many, many different types of networks. And so, you know, today, I think many in the West mistakenly um, um, imagine that the internet will necessarily be a vehicle for their values of liberalism and commerce and, uh, you know, democracy, right? Because they assume that there's one protocol. But in fact, you know, OGAS would have been a healthier version of some of the things that we're seeing today, which is, most networked technologies are not on the internet. Most of them are corporate. Most of them are highly private. They're about capital accumulation and the concentration of power. Of course, we also have, you know, attempts within Russia to go off the grid. And of course, the great firewall of China um, and, you know, North Korea and, and other places, um, the CCTV networks maybe in, in Britain, all, all as demonstrations that there have always been many networks. And I think in some case, it might be more healthy for us. And the Ogos would have been helpful here um, to say, 
our default is not one network, but many. From that, we get a, a richer understanding of politics and cu culture and society. And also, I think a more realistic view um, uh, because there's so many mistakes that Western commentators are making uh, you know, because they don't have examples like Ogos, perhaps. There are several Thank remarks you. from Yaroslav. Maybe Yaroslav wants uh, to ask the question. Yeah. Or anyone? Yaroslav's comments are, are helpful, I think. I, I, yeah. can't, uh, I can't talk as I'm working and we have uh, half an hour, a commandant hour. So of course, uh, of course. I've, I've, I've just uh, not asked, but I uh, give some commands as uh, the digitalization processes uh, catalyze uh, the system as it is, not uh, improve the system. So uh, the main problem maybe of the Soviet system was that uh, the inner uh, economic and social economic processes uh, that it has uh, in the 60s, 70s, uh, when the cybernetics was the main topic, uh, well, uh, despite uh, uh, they say cybernetica продажная девка капитализма. So these uh, processes uh, lead to decay, and uh, this uh, system would catalyze these processes. So uh, the uh, main problem of Lushko's Agas was that uh, uh, he said one phrase that uh, one million of Soviet people, he means bureaucrats, mm -hmm. uh, would uh, have a better job, well, uh, more, use, more useful for people job. Mm -hmm. So uh, the bureaucrats uh, understand uh, they would uh, be out of the, uh, well, uh, warm seats and uh, they should uh, work hard. And so they uh, do anything, anything they can to stop this system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, main, the main problem, uh, this, uh, uh, the decision on this system uh, was uh, given to the Gosstat, mm -hmm. uh, the government statistics. Uh, and uh, the government statistics was, uh, well, just written. It, uh, not, it was not a statistics, uh, it was Putonkin land, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the contradiction was between uh, Gosstat and Gosplan. Well, uh, because Gosplan uh, writes some uh, uh, prices, uh, well, on any goods, etc. And uh, uh, that was not real, uh, not based on real uh, physical values. And uh, as my uh, professor, Chernovsky, Dmitry Sergeyevich, he was uh, sometime uh, secretary of the Institute uh, head in by Alex Berg. And uh, he told me that uh, the main problem was that uh, this, uh, that was, well, Kassove I don't mm -hmm. uh, know mm -hmm. as it for English. Mm -hmm. uh, so the main problem was, and uh, the, this process is leads to the 80s when we uh, had uh, uh, no goods uh, on the bookshelves, or on the shelves uh, of the store shelves, uh, yes, in the, mar uh, in the market, uh, but we have black market where mm -hmm. we could uh, buy some things, but uh, in more, uh, more pricing uh, things, yes, more, more, uh, by, but by more uh, money that uh, in the government uh, stores. So, and uh, the main point is that uh, the Gostat government statistics uh, hide this Kassove uh, 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 So they just draw some things, uh, some, some, some uh, digits, and uh, that digits uh, have no uh, right it, value, not a reality. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, so the 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 
gas system would show this all these processes as it uh, digitalized them. And, right. uh, and the, main, the main problem uh, of uh, realizing this system was in it. Uh, so uh, it, it, it should, uh, it could uh, decay or well, uh, should. Uh, uh, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. No, thank you. Well, um, I, I, I like that home. reading. I, I, I think that's a helpful reading. I, I'm sharing a paragraph in English. It's been translated, um, but it, it's kind of a nut graph. And I think it's capturing the bureaucratic uh, splintering that you're talking about. But I like your reading that it's actually the... the um, the reality of the economic values um, that that are the core mechanisms. So I've I've been arguing that it's the non reconciliation of different bureaucratic networks, right? Gastat versus Gasplan, uh, you know, uh, right? The Minister of Finance versus um, um, the stati Central Statistical Administration. Um, but I like I like your argument that it's. Uh, fundamentally about the reality of the values that are being expressed. Um, and I, I think that's compatible in some ways with a, a bureaucratic network that is not um, resilient, right? Uh, so in, in your argument, the digitization would have accelerated the non-resilience of the bureaucratic economy, um, which is interesting if, if I'm understanding it correctly. Anyway, thank you, Yaroslav. Can I thank can you. I call on people? I, I see Dick uh, Van Valente. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, thank you for your very interesting talk. Uh, you talk about um, um, a, a high concentration of cyber talent in Ukraine, mm -hmm. and a, and a, and a kind of a talent for networking. Uh, could you uh, explain why this is so? specific for the Ukraine, why Yeah. Why have these talents developed there so, so well, early? I, I, thank you. I would be happy to say a few remarks, although I would really trust our audience <laughs> to know even better than I do, of course. So I would, I would welcome to listen. Um, but let me just offer a few quick ideas. One is that there is a bold and proud tradition of public education in technical, particularly technical public education that comes out of 70, 80 years, uh, um, Soviet Union and subsequently. Um, so there's a strong mathematical foundation for a lot of thinking. There's also a kind of, if you're worried about politics or ideology, there's a there's a um, ability to keep yourself safe by studying abstraction. Um, and so there's you know strong educational talents um, where everybody has access to and assumptions about, uh, about learning math. Um, and I think, uh, Although we can find in the 50s and 60s and 70s a kind of hard war race in the Cold War, what's really interesting now is that most cyber technologies are relatively cheap, um, right? So you do not need a super advanced uh, world economy to have access to off the shelf uh, software tools and, and to be able to have access to um, uh, a number of different uh, tools that help you carry out uh, cyber work, you know, legally or illegally. Um, and that actually on the economy question, I would also note another point. And I, I don't want to be on the record as like being entirely pro cyber crime, but let me be really clear that crime in this case is often defined complicatedly by your relationship to the state, right? And Ukraine has a very clear, as a state has a very clear different set of interests than Russia. And this is how I understand Russian cyber talent problems. Basically the Russian state, so long as you are doing criminal activities that benefit the Russian state, you can usually continue to do that. Occasionally, you know, when Putin needs to make concessions to Europe or, or um, America, will you know, do a, a, a token sting against a ransomware as service group. Um, uh, for strike, for example, um, or you will occasionally kind of do a little bit of enforcement, but broadly, there's a lot of space for doing uh, 
cyber activities that serve the Russian state interests. Now, the Ukrainians' interest is obviously very different. Um, um, and there's two things that that means. One, if you're going to be um, in, in doing non-state cyber activities, um, there is genuine opportunity to do something that you'd need, which is have access to capital. You can earn money, you can make a profit. Um, your work could often be competitive on a global market without moving. You can work remotely. Um, and, and so there's an economic attraction to many actors um, today. But the second is that the fact that the Ukrainian state and the Russian state alliance interests do not align, mean that there's a strong interest among so-called non-state cyber criminals or just non-cyber, non-state cyber actors to work together um, uh, to, to, to get profit or to do other things. And I think that this has meant a kind of historic strength um, in, 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 in the shadow and, and shadow and gray market. Let me give you an example that I think is less uh, sort of hot, which is shadow libraries, right? In many ways, um, much of the world's scholarly networks are able to access what would have been copyrighted material hidden behind very expensive paywalls from European and American universities, thanks to Russian speaking, Ukrainian speaking, and others' um, uh, uh, willingness to gather materials in, in open public places. And so the, the American and European states criminalize this because they're kind of copyright empires stand a profit from resisting this. But meanwhile, the service being rendered to the world, you know, if you're studying neuroscience in Kazakhstan, right, you, you don't have access to thousands of dollars of journal subscriptions. And so I think that's an example of, a, of a, a, an alliance of interests that's actually not criminal, but is beneficial, arguably, in the world, um, very beneficial, uh, that, that can emerge in a place like Ukraine that can't emerge elsewhere. I don't know if that, but um, um, let me be quiet and, and really listen because that's a view from afar from Tulsa. I would love to hear what you think. Um, why is there a concentration of cyber talent in Ukraine? Uh, several announcements. We are working about new events. The information we'll try to put into our resources as quickly as possible. Please subscribe to our information resources, YouTube, Telegram, Facebook channels. Also, you can make donations to medical support of Ukrainian people or to our project in Patreon. Who wants to ask the questions? Also, you can put raise hand function so I can give you what anyone to ask questions. Can we turn the problem of the networks to nowadays? Francis Fukuyama said on the last article, Ukraine win, Russia lost. Ukraine protected democracy, the democracy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, I, <laughs> I find myself in a strange place of listening to Francis Fukuyama and, and nodding. Usually I, I, <laughs> I'm not inclined. Um, but I think uh, Ruslan, that's a that's a very interesting um, um, uh, perspective. I think what is very clear for me, and I would welcome again. I you don't need my observations from Tulsa. I, I need yours. Um, is that in the long run, Ukraine absolutely will win, uh, and Russia is clearly on the moral losing side, the political geostrategic losing side. It's against its own self interest to do this. Right, everything about it is pushing towards its loss. Um, I, I, I can't imagine what it says to say that while also you know, realizing the genuine destruction and loss and pain and suffering that you all are um, in, in Ukraine are enduring. Um, and you know, I, I cannot predict the balance of winners and losers when everyone loses in war, right? War is always a loss, um, but let me, let me just express solidarity. And I, I would welcome um, others' thoughts. I, I, I definitely buy this Ruslan in the sense that 
Uh, Ukraine is resilient, right? It has, as uh, Lesya Ukrainka talks about, sto uh, roky v unisti, right? A hundred years of youth, um, which I think is a beautiful phrase. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, long resilient. Um, so I, I, I would welcome other thoughts. Are there other ways of thinking about networks nowadays within Ukraine? Anyone? Are there any questions? We have only one hour, I think, or maybe earlier than the event because Ben has his day break before the lectures at his university. I think our audience are tired. <laughs> well, it is late. And I know that you, many of you are um, under uh, the new, if you're in Kiev, I've just learned about the two day stay at home order. So, uh, let me also just share my personal email. And if folks would be interested in being in touch, I would love to. Uh, yes, excellent. Yeah, this is what I wanna hear about. I, I would be happy to connect people to um, media forums if you want to publish. If, uh, in fact, I was just here, this, give me a second. Um, uh, there's a, this is not a big uh, uh, opportunity, but I think it's a good one. Um, uh, Geert Lovink is uh, publishing journal notes from people who would be interested in, in sharing more. And he invites, I've just shared the link. If you have comments, he has a team that wants to edit your insights and observations and they would be happy to post them. Um, uh, I've done so, Svetlana Matvienko has done so, a number of other people have done so. So if you are keeping journals, please share your insights with him and he can publish. Um, I would also, Yaroslav, if you have insights into what the local resistance, not just resilience, but resistance looks like, and if I can help you um, connect to, uh, to uh, forums or um, institutions. I could probably get you a talk at, who knows, a, a good university. I might be able to connect you if we have the right connections to, I just gave comments in Forbes uh, magazine yesterday. So I think there's an opportunity to me to be a kind of publishing uh, mechanism for, for you all. So please do reach out if you have uh, stories uh, that you would like to advance. Okay, Ben, we are, uh, Dick Vanuente, do you want to ask a question? I just want to add uh, on behalf of Ecotech, uh, the International Organization of Historians of Technology that, uh, um, you know, same as Ben says, whenever you want to tell us, tell the community of historians of technology something about your work, about conditions of working and so on, uh, email to us and um, we have our newsletter we can connect to the to the ecotech community mm -hmm. agreed i i would also note i'm sure you all know this but if you haven't looked through this google document there's um i'm i'm trying to get institutions to figure out how to pay uh, ukrainian researchers and scholars remotely so that you can stay in ukraine Meanwhile, there's also a number of resources for people who are trying to flee to safety. Um, and please, if you haven't seen these, do review, do review those. But yeah, I would, I would welcome conversation under any condition. And you know, my, my heart and mind and hands go to you all um, in Ukraine. Um, Slava hey Ukraini. We are greatly thankful Thank you, ben. for your support, for your support, uh, people of Ukraine. Uh, it's, uh, it was a good event. It also helped to resist nervous atmosphere mm. we have already for several weeks. Mm. And I'm uh, ending the record. Mm. Also, may I say a few words? Oh, uh, yeah. a, a kind of wait. advertising my own projects, except being an architect and specialist in uh, energy efficiency of buildings. The topic that led me to scientific meetings was another my hobby and uh, the, the mm, field of interest was uh, gnomonics. If you know, it's uh, the uh, 
field of mathematics, exactly geometry, uh, connected to design of sundials, astrolabes, and other systems. Mm. And I last year I made a lecture on history of astrolabes. So mm. I see that many of you are come from the field of history of um, the of a computer, of cal 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 of uh, the technologies, of information technologies. Yes, is it true? Mm -hmm. So I uh, maybe I'll come back to scientific meetings. Maybe uh, in um, yeah, maybe it will be a lecture in English uh, on uh, medieval astronomy and calculations. Then may I send now a picture? It's of one of our devices. Uh, if you can see the picture, it's a device we've replicated in the 16th century astronomical computer to. I, ho I hope you can see the picture now. Uh, presumably in, uh, designed mm. by a Spanish priest, uh, Fra Francisco Zarzoso, and uh, there are many similar devices they were designed by English and German mathematicians from 14th till 16th century. Mm -hmm. Mostly calculating processes in geocentric universe. And I hope we'll Gorgeous. The event, next event. We are working on several events to start. Please follow our information resources. Also, we are grateful another uh, for Ben's help for the support of people of Ukraine. Be careful during this uh, very difficult period, and see you on next scientific meetings. I'm ending the record.